as a church. In case you're wondering, we've got those milestones listed to my left on the banner. We've got them listed in your bulletins. We've got them listed in our hallways. And the milestone that we come to today is this. Life. Life in Christ. Now, at the very heart of this milestone is this idea that all of us should be in a growing, growing relationship with Jesus Christ. It should never become stagnant. There's always something, something we can learn. There's always an area in our lives where we can improve on. Now, Paul describes this growing relationship with Jesus as the fruit of the Spirit. I mentioned the fruit of the Spirit a little bit last week, and I want to to delve a little more in-depth with the fruit of the Spirit this week so that we can see what a, a growing relationship with Jesus truly looks like. Paul mentions the fruit of the Spirit in the book of Galatians, the fifth chapter, beginning with verse 22. And this is what Paul writes. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. The word of God for the people of God. Would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts, souls, and minds gathered in this place be acceptable unto thee, O God, our rock and our salvation. Amen. So Paul lists nine qualities, nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. And so this morning, I'm going to go through all, quickly, I'm going to go through all nine of those qualities, all nine of those characteristics when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. The first quality, the first characteristic is love. Now this is not, it's not an emotional, mushy, sentimental type of love. This is a sacrificial, this is an unconditional type of love. This love is a decision a decision of choice rather than a decision of emotion. It's a decision of choice rather than a decision of emotion. Think about two people when they're first starting to go out, right? When they first start to go out, when they first start seeing each other, they both want to put their best foot forward. They, they, they both want to appear to the other one as beautiful, as handsome as they, as they can. And so when they first start going out, you know, she's always got her hair done and her makeup on. She's always dressing up, and, you know, he, well, he's a guy. At least I hope he's putting on a clean pair of pants, right? But when you first start going out, you always put your best foot forward. You always want to look beautiful. You always want to look handsome. And I'll tell you, it's easy, it's easy to emotionally love someone when all you see is the good. It's easy to love someone when when all they are is beautiful or handsome. But if those two people stick together long enough, right, if they get married, eventually they're going to see one another with bed bed hair and bed head, and they're going to have to deal with halitosis. And and eventually, inevitably, right, inevitably, if you're you're together long enough, you're going to see your spouse, you know, throw up in a toilet. And there, there is nothing pretty about watching someone throw up. I don't care who you are. There's no good way to throw up in a toilet. But eventually, you're, you know, you're going to see your spouse do that, right? And it's in those times, it's in those moments when you choose, when you choose to love them. You choose to love them when they have bedhead. You choose to love them when they have halitosis. You choose to love them when they, they keep you up all night snoring. You choose to love them when when you see them thrown up in the toilet. You choose to love them even when they're grumpy. You choose to love them even when they have bad days. Now, as as I was mentioning all those things, you know, every now and then someone would point to their spouse. That was you. You're the snorer. Now, in Greek, there are several different names for love, and and the Greek name for love here is, is agape. And again, this is an unconditional, it's a covenantal, type of love. It's not based on emotion. It's based on choice. I choose, I choose to love you. The second fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about is joy. Now joy is is different than happiness. 
happiness is an emotion that comes, that comes and goes. You know, uh, when, uh, when I'm throwing up in the toilet, I'm not happy. When my favorite team loses the big game, I am not happy. Happiness is an emotion that comes and goes. It's fleeting. I like to compare it to bubbles, right? We all, we all like bubbles. Is there anyone who doesn't like bubbles? Come on. I mean, honestly, is there anybody that does not like bubbles? I don't see any hands going up. Everybody likes bubbles. You know, you love bubbles. You love to, to blow bubbles, right? Man, that was weak. Two bubbles on it. At, ca- at camp this year, there was one uh, worship service where Sarah gave all the kids bubbles, and uh, they were blowing bubbles at the beginning of the service. And I'll tell you, they were the envy of all the other ca- uh, campers there at, uh, at camp. I mean, we all love bubbles. We love to blow bubbles. You know, as a kid, we blow them all the time. Somehow, some, somehow we get older and we stop blowing bubbles. You know, when, when you have a stressed-out day, grab some bubbles and blow some bubbles. It's so fun. But here's the thing, right? Bubbles are like happiness. You blow the bubble and eventually it what? It pops. And the same is true with happiness. Happiness comes and happiness goes. But joy, but joy lasts a lifetime. As a Christian, we always can have joy within our hearts. And the reason is this, is because joy at the very heart of joy Joy is largely made up of gratitude. Biblical joy is made up of gratitude. So even when you're throwing up in the toilet, even when you're having that bad day, even when work doesn't go so well, you can have joy because you are grateful. Because you are grateful for what God has done for you. You are grateful for the promises that God has given to us that he will never leave us, he will never forsake us. You are grateful for that promise that Jesus gives to us that he will be with us to the very end of the age. And even in those moments when we are in the the, the deepest part of pain that we can be in, we can still be grateful because we know there was a Savior who went to the cross to die for us. That there is a Savior who understands our greatest, our greatest pain. In all things, we can, we can be grateful. You're not always going to be happy. But we can be grateful. I think in, in order to, to, to live a joyful life, we, we have to, you know, lift up our praises to God every day. A great way to do that is a, is a gratitude journal. If you've never tried it, I invite you to try it. You know, you don't have to sit down and write for 10 minutes. Basically, a gratitude journal is sitting down and writing two to five things that you are thankful for on that day. It'll, it'll change your day. You'll gain more and more joy as you become more and more grateful for what God has given to you. And if you can't think of anything, just be grateful that, you know, the the sun came up again, that it's a brand new day. In Psalm 118, verse 24, the psalmist says, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The third quality of the fruit of the Spirit is peace peace. Now, I'm sure many of you are aware that, uh, you know, Paul George, Paul George is an NBA player. He plays for the Indiana Pacers. I'm a big Paul George fan. And if, you, if you've seen the news, um, you know, a few weeks back, he was playing for Team USA. He went to block a shot. He came down wrong. He broke his leg. But he just didn't break his leg. It was like a compound fracture. It was like a bone sticking out of his leg. Kyrie Irving, who is also an NBA player who is playing on Team USA, saw it, and almost immediately, Kyrie Irving went to his dad, wrapped his arms around his father, and started to sob at the sight, at the sight of this injury. But what was amazing about the whole thing is that you, see, you saw all of his teammates, and all of them are like in shock. Kyrie Irving, Irving is sobbing, yet there was Paul George on the floor And he was calm as could be. Later, someone asked him about it, and this is what he said. He said, I remember the training staff coming over and being by my side, holding me down, telling me to stay calm and not to look at my leg. Now, that's the greatest advice ever. (laughs) He goes on, that definitely helped me to not panic. 
I knew I had people by my side. They took my mind off of what had just happened. Thanks to the docs, to my family coming over, my parents coming by my side, teammates coming over, that pain quickly went away. Well, for us, spiritually speaking, as disciples of Jesus Christ, as people who have been given the fruit of the Spirit. It's in the midst of turmoil, it's in the midst of chaos, it's in the midst of pain that the Holy Spirit comes alongside us and gives us that peace that passes all understanding. It's in times of hurt, it's in times of pain that we are given that supernatural peace. And sometimes that peace comes from other people. Other people praying for us, other people coming by our side, taking our mind off those things that are hurting us. The fruit of the Spirit. It gives you a supernatural, a supernatural peace. A peace that passes all, all understanding. It is calm, it is calm in the midst of the storm. Fourth characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit, patience. Patience. Now, in Greek, this literally means the ability to hold one's temper for a long time. Okay? So here, we're not, you know, we're not dealing with patience during your diet. We're not dealing with patience as you recover from a broken bone. For me, those things deal more more closely with peace, right? We should have peace with the situation as we're healing. We should have peace in our diet. But here, specifically speaking, patience is the ability to hold one's temper for a long time. That's one of the fruit, fruit of the Spirit. And so when the person cuts you off, you have patience, right? When someone, uh, specs, when, when someone speaks badly about you, you have patience. When your kids are driving you nuts, you have, you have patience. We might have the ability to seek revenge. We might have the ability to strike another person. But we refrain from doing so because we have patience. If you have an anger problem, what you need is the fruit of the Spirit that is patience. The fifth quality of the fruit of the Spirit is kindness. In Greek, it's the word krestos, and part of its meaning is usefulness. Part of its meaning is usefulness. So when you are kind, you are useful to someone else. When you are kind, you are assisting someone, you're helping someone. It's more than words. 1 John 3, 18 tells us, Dear children, let us stop just saying we love each other. Let us really show it by our actions. Now, I don't want to downplay words because we know that words can hurt, words can heal. But more than just saying kind words, we need to show kind actions. That's what the fruit of the Spirit leads us to do. It calls us to go out and to be kind. The sixth quality of the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. Now, goodness refers to to, to God's nature. God God is good. When God created everything in the garden, when God created everything after the six days, right? So everything's done. God looked at it, and what did God say that it was? He said it was very good. God is good. James chapter 1, verse 17 tells us every good, not some, not the majority, not 99% of the time, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. Every good gift is from God. And so even when a non-believer does good, And I see it all the time. Even when a non-believer does good, whether they know it or not, whether they want to attribute it to God or not, when even a non-believer does good, I believe it's God working through them. In the Methodist Church, we believe in this thing called prevenient grace. And that is God's grace given to us even before we know or believe in a God. So every good thing, every good thing comes from the grace of God. God working through us through the Holy Spirit. And as people of God, we should be doing good things. We are not God, but we can have a little bit of God's nature. We can be good, not from our own, not from our own power, but through the power of the Spirit. Goodness. 
The seventh quality of faith, the seventh quality of the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. Faithfulness. I read, I read a Hallmark card once, and, and I'm not even sure what this means. But I'm not sure I like it, you know? I'm not sure it passes the smell test. I read a Hallmark, Hallmark card once that said, I can't promise you forever, but I can promise you today. <laughs> Again, I'm not even sure what that means. I, ca- I, can't, I, can't, I can't promise you forever, but I can promise you today. And again, I don't know what it is, but there's just something about it I don't like. When I married my wife, it just wasn't for a day. It was until death do us part. You know, it's so easy to to, to love someone on your wedding day. She's dressed up, he's in a tux, come on. There's food and there's dancing, there's family, there's friends. It's easy to love someone for a day. Especially if that day is your wedding day. It gets a little harder to love someone for your lifetime. Faithfulness. I once heard a great definition of faithfulness. I did not come up with this. Someone else did. Faithfulness is love hanging on. Isn't that a great definition of faithfulness? Faithfulness is love hanging on. Faithfulness is love saying, I will not quit. There may be misunderstandings, there may be disappointments, there may be discouragements, but I will not quit. We need to be faithful with God. We need to say to God, God, I will not quit believing in you. I will not quit trusting in you. We need to say to our spouse, I will not quit, even in the midst of disappointments, even in the midst of hardship, even in the midst of maybe my emotions not being what they should be, I will not quit. And we need to say it to our kids. I will not quit. Regardless what you do, regardless where you go, I will not quit. Faithfulness is love hanging on. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The eighth uh, quality of the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. I want to define gentleness as power under control. Gentleness is power under control. Think about your tongue. Think about speech. You know, your tongue left uh, unchecked, your speech left unchecked, can do a lot of damage. Your words can do a lot of damage. Your words can damage someone else's reputation. Your words can hurt someone else's feelings. Your words can deceive and hurt those people closest to you. Your tongue, your words left unchecked can do a lot of negative things. But controlled, your words, your tongue, when they are controlled, words words can inspire a nation. Words can save someone's life. Words can recite a a, a prayer of healing. Gentleness. It's power uncontrolled, and as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we should be gentle with our words, with our actions. And then the the ninth quality of uh, the fruit of the Spirit is one that I think holds them all together. We need this one to to be able to do all of the rest. And that is self-control. We need, we need self-control. Now for me, self-control, uh, the long and the short of it is replacing, replacing a bad choice with a good choice. It's replacing a, a, a bad habit with a good habit. Because you have a, if you have a problem with something and you just want to go cold turkey, if you have a problem with something and just want to quit it, if you, just, if you have a problem and just don't want to do it, if you don't replace it with something else, eventually you're going to go back to it. There's a group of us uh, who've, who've read the Daniel play, Plan, 40 Days to a Healthier Life. On September 14th, we're going to get together as a group during Sunday school just to help one another live healthier. It's a six-week uh, six study. 
But as I read that book, uh, the thing that really resonated with me was the food portion. I've got, I've got um, because of various reasons, I've got a lot of arthritis. I deal with inflammation in my joints. And part of what the book was talking about was the foods that we eat, and a lot of those foods are inflammatory. And so I'm trying to, trying to change what I eat so that my joints, so that my arthritis isn't always inflamed. And see, I, I kind of have a problem in the afternoons. When I visit the hospital or nursing home or visit folks in the church, usually it's in the afternoons. And if I'm out and about and it's like 3, 30, 4 o'clock, I start getting a little hungry. And usually what I, what I did before was, you know, um, I'd stop at McDonald's, and I'm not a big fan of their food, but again, I love their what? I love their Coke, thank you. It used to be I'd stop at McDonald's and get me a big Coke. I'd stop and, and get me a, a Snickers bar at a convenience store. Snickers, Snickers, they satisfy, they do. Or better yet, and honest, honestly, these, these are my three choices usually. Uh, Coke, uh, Snickers, I usually wouldn't do all three at the same time, unless, you know, unless it was a really crazy week. But, but my third choice would be, um, I'd stop somewhere and get me a Krispy Kreme donut. Again, I didn't do them all together. But that's what, that's what I would usually do. 3.34, if I'm out and about, I'd get hungry and I'd just stop for one of those things. But I kid you not, this past week, there were two occasions. On one, I was going to the hospital. The other, I was going to nursing home. 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I started getting hungry. I needed something but instead of stopping at McDonald's, and I thought about it long and hard, instead of stopping at a convenience store, I went to the supermarket. Now, if I had done nothing, it would have gotten to the point where I've just broken down and gotten a Coke. But I stopped at the supermarket, I went inside, and I got me a red delicious apple. Now, my wife doesn't like red delicious apples, so she never buys them. And you know, they're just not the same when you buy like the five pound bag of red delicious apples. You get the little ones, you're never sure what you're getting. I like to go in there and I like to go to the produce, po produce section and buy the one I think that looks the best. So I went, cost, literally, with tax, it cost, well, I don't think there is tax on food, but it cost me a dollar, exactly a dollar. And I saw it as a sky opening and as a thing from God saying, see, I don't know why. I have a thing with numbers. That's something else you can ask my wife about. But it um, cost me exactly a dollar. I just saw this as a sign. This was what I'm supposed to be doing. And guess what? You know, I ate my apple. It tasted good. I got rid of, of that, those hunger pains. And maybe more than anything else, mentally, mentally, I felt a whole lot better. And when we look at our spiritual lives, when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, ultimately God has given us the fruit of the Spirit because He loves us desperately. God loves us desperately. So much so that he gave his son to die on a cross, that he gave us the power of the Holy Spirit so that we would have the fruit of the Spirit, so that we could live abundant lives. So that we could feel good. So we could feel good about ourselves. The fruit of the Spirit. That life in Christ. Always grow. Never remain stagnant. Would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power of your spirit. We thank you for your grace and for your love. We thank you for that, um, that love is that that love that is so overwhelming, that and it gave to us your son, that love that is so overwhelming that you want, you want us to be filled with the Spirit. Who wouldn't want to be more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, more patient, more kind, more good, more faithful, more gentle, more self-control? These are awesome qualities to have. And you have given them to us. You've offered them. It's, it's a, just a gift. I just pray we may center our lives upon you. Dear God, thank you for, for being here with us. Thank you for loving us. Give us these qualities. Give us the fruit of the Spirit. And may we never hunger. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand with me as we join together in our closing song.